my name is Lydia and I'm here to help you with the oboe and I'm going to show you some of my warm-ups that I did when I was in high school. So I actually have the very original sheet that I kept in my folder in high school and I would do my warm-ups written out here that I, I typed up. I would do them for an hour-ish before I started practicing. So let's just go ahead and go through. The first notes that I played on my oboe were just low notes so that I wouldn't get any water up top. And especially if you have a wooden instrument, it's probably best to play only low notes for the first few minutes. So I would do a scale for a little bit and it would sound like this. And back down. So the next thing I would do after a few minutes of that is B flat to D flat, then B natural to D flat. So basically this is about noticing the blips between my keys and the fingers making blips if you don't uh, lift to the keys at the exact right moment. So in this case, B flat to D flat is something I noticed in my practice and I wrote it down as something I wanted to isolate. So I would do that every single day, as well as B natural to D flat. I would repeat it slurred. And these transitions were particularly noticeable because you go from so few fingers to so many and uh, just try and hit all of those keys at the same time without any blips and getting random notes that you don't want in there. That's something that I would really listen for in my practice. If I heard any blips, then I would write it down. So I had penciled in C to E flat and B flat to E flat. All right, so next is long tone chromatics. Basically, you put your tuner on and you have your metronome on at 60. And I wrote at least three notes. So do this with at least three notes. So let's put my metronome on here at 60. This is a metronome and a tuner, so I can have them both on at the same time. So the next thing is vibrato exercises with the tuner on and the metronome at 60. At least three notes I said here as well. And I said to do it loud and soft. So try different dynamics with this. Basically trying to keep your vibrato in the green and there are much better apps for this now than this. The tunable app really, really helps you stay in the green. You can see exactly the waves that you do. I think it might be like a dollar. It's totally worth the dollar or some, whatever it is. Just get it. Um, it's, it's really helpful. It's hard to stay in the green. It's easier to stay on the green for this kind of tuner. So the other one's a little, if you want to challenge yourself. So I did that one a little bit soft. I kind of crescendoed towards the end. So this exercise is about changing the rhythms of your vibrato and making sure you stay in the green so you can still have the vibrato, but it's always in tune. So first it was then triplets and then and then sextuplets or something as you get faster and faster. Let me try it on another note a little louder this time. Then 
that's the idea. It gives you a little more flexibility with your vibrato. And like I said, the tunable app, you'll be able to see how wide your vibrato is going to, which might be really interesting to see. So next I said basic long tones. How long can you go? Let's limbo. That's what I wrote in here <laughs> instead of how low can you go? So basically it's just a matter of timing yourself, having fun with it and uh, trying to beat your score from the day before. Let's see, I haven't done one of these in a long time. Let's see if I can reach like a minute or something of a long tone. Okay, I can see because it's timing myself. So I did reach a minute, but as you can see, it's really important to breathe out when you're playing the oboe because oh, I had so much air still left in me. So make sure you breathe out in between for your rest and you'll feel much better because there's just so much. We could just keep going and going and going because so little air goes through this thing. All right, <clears throat> next is TT. I called it TT, tune and transition. This is basically octave jumps. So I have A, B flat, B natural, C, D flat, and D. So I would go ahead and do my octave jumps for each of those notes and I would pay attention to my intonation, especially on the high, higher octave. And also on the transition and the connection between those notes and making it sound a little bit more like a vocalist and being um, aware of the air between the notes. So I'll demonstrate. You can kind of mess around. Oh, this one's hard. So right now I think my pinky, this is the one that's throwing me off. It's either too early or too late. Oh, I forgot to do high D. Let me just see that really quick. <laughs> You can sort of hear the blips on this one, so hopefully it'll get better the more I do it. And what I'm doing as I go along is um, adjusting something so that I move it slightly earlier, slightly later so that it eliminates all the blips in between. That's the idea. And so, yeah, then I wrote in 
I wrote in, I penciled in a lot more, a lot more. So that just kind of went to show like my original warm up is what's in text. But then all of this stuff I penciled in was during my practice sessions. If I noticed something that didn't sound quite right to me, I would add it to my warm ups. More tuning interval is high C to high C sharp. High C to high D. And I am noticing my transition in addition to the intonation here. Half whole D to high B. Left hand F to forked F. Oh, this is a good one. Trying to make sure that your forked F sounds the same as your normal fingering for F. Trying to get them as similar as you can because normally the forked F is going to sound a little more muffled. It's also a little lower, the forked F. That's a fun one. It's just so that if you ever need to use your forked F, but you still want it to sound as resonant as the normal F, then you know kind of how to, what kind of air to use and what kind of embouchure to use to make it sound the same, or at least very similar. Low E flat to low B flat, that's a really hard one. Interesting. High D flat to high E flat. <laughs> Begin the pool ank. <laughs> So I guess I, I thought the Poulenc Sonata, I wanted to make sure I could nail it every time. And I think it's a sort of the same if you have an excerpt that drives you crazy, that, you know, it's kind of hard or you get in your head about it. Just add it to your warm up every day and make it something that you just are used to doing and getting up and doing without, um, without much prep. about that high D just uh, coming out of nowhere nice and soft left hand F to D flat oh yeah I can hear the blips G to C. So just trying to eliminate any blips. So more you could do is E flat to A or E flat to A flat or E flat to G. a very good one to do because you kind of have to open your throat up a little bit for the low G. For those I think it's helpful to play the lower note. Um, play the high note with the same embouchure as you would for the low note. So think about the G first and then play the E flat rather than trying to play the G with the E flat embouchure. Because 
Because if I were to start with the E flat embouchure, which you probably just heard earlier, well, now I'm sort of in the habit of doing it, but you would get that kind of squeaky. So, yeah, try and open your throat a little bit. Open your throat and also a little bit more oval shape. Um, dropping your jaw. Okay, so something I also said was you can hum while doing these. That was something I used to do a lot to open my throat, as I was just saying. So you can't really have your throat be tight when you're humming. Hmm, it just like relaxes it automatically. So if you can hum while you play, so pick a note and try humming while you play. So I'll demonstrate what that would sound like. It's a little weird sounding. <laughs> It's not going to be the best tone in the world. It's just so you can get some noise from your throat while playing the instrument. Hopefully you can hear me going behind the scenes. <laughs> so I would do some of those half hole exercises while humming. just as a way to train myself to open up. So tonguing, I would, I have at 120, so I would do 16th notes at 120. You can click your way up as you get comfortable. And your tongue is a muscle and it's gonna get slower and slower as you go on because it's gonna get tired. And try and keep your tongue very light because it has the ability to go much harder and stronger than we actually need it to. So try and be lighter and it will get less tired. Okay, this is something I tell my students a lot which is keep your fingers closer to the keys. And this is something I did in high school just to really pay attention to keeping my fingers super close, I would, and I would try and move from the knuckles. So rather than trying to lift my whole finger or like a flat finger and lifting or lifting from here, I would try and lift always from these knuckles, something I was taught in high school. I know a good way you can practice that is like on the desk or something and on your kitchen table or your desk in class say this is the table right here um and you're just moving your fingers up and down but try and keep the same curve in the finger and just move them from the knuckles it's much it's hardest on your ring finger because that one is like the weakest of the fingers um to try and do them in isolation and move from the knuckle just so you get the feeling of all of your movements from on the oboe keys should be from your knuckle and not from anywhere else on your finger. So in this case, I would do F sharp to G and I would keep my fingers as close as I possibly could to the oboe. Sometimes I wouldn't even lift it because you don't need to um, and focus on moving from the knuckle. G to A. This one you do have to lift it off the key because of the hole on the key. F sharp to A. Okay, so I can't help but think about the transition too, and I wasn't really thinking about how close my fingers were, so let me do that again. It's kind of funny because when I was focusing on keeping my fingers closer, the transition was actually much better. So um, maybe that's the best way to do the transition is to those earlier, so earlier in the video I was talking about the transition between notes. Maybe if you just think about keeping your fingers as close as possible to the instrument, it will help with those transitions. B flat to C. And B flat. 
flat to B natural. This one's a key one to do for the transitions. It's so easy to find out. It's only, it's either this one or this one that's moving before the other, if there is a blip. So it's easy to find out which one it is and do the opposite. <laughs> I want to see what else I had penciled in here. Yeah, left hand E flat to E natural. That's a good one because it's something you don't do that often, but when you do have to do it, you're not going to be used to it unless you've practiced it before. You could hear that little blip on the penultimate one I just did. <laughs> It's interesting to try and figure out which finger is moving before the other. Uh, and then I just say, if more warm up is necessary, then I could do my major and minor scales or major and minor arpeggios, major scales and thirds, or more sight reading from the orchestral excerpt book or others. So yeah, that was what I did every, every day. Uh, and it would take around an hour before well, it's only taken like a half hour just now, and that was with a lot of explanation, but maybe I needed to do a little bit more hefty duty stuff because now, now those transitions are a lot cleaner because I put so much work in. So um, I hope this was helpful to you and hope you have a good day.